Hi and welcome to our Tech Talk Aftermarket Podcast. We are here at Auto Mechanica, live from the show floor. And our next guest is Andreas Habeck from Egon Zehnder. I'm really happy that he found the time joining us because he's really busy today. His day started early as well. This morning we had breakfast together. And so I'm happy he's at the, at the, at the show now. For our, for our audience, if you could introduce yourself a bit, I guess many of you might still know you from the aftermarket, but the ones who don't know you, so who are you and what are you doing at uh, Egon Zehnder? Sure. So thanks a lot, first of all. And indeed, breakfast was early. So as you say, my name is Andreas. Um, I'm with Egon Zinder. And what we do, um, we might be known for executive search. So we identify and convince people uh, in leadership positions, typically at more or less top management level. What we do on top is a wide area of topics around maybe leadership advisory, as you could call it. So we help management teams, management individuals uh, in their development today. And how would you say the split is between like management consulting and executive search? Is it like on par? So it's not on par, but if you look globally, it differs massively. You have markets like Japan, where the leadership advisory part is much more. You have markets, and to be honest, Germany is a market where search is still at least two-thirds of the business. Okay. But then increasingly, you also have kind of a blurred line in between. Yeah? So if you... If you identify someone, sometimes in CEO successions, we start two years in advance, we um, screen the market, at the same time see what is actually needed, who, who are internal candidates who could fit, yeah. how can we develop them, and then in the end you basically have a full service that goes from, or has different elements, and not just kind of the pure calling people and asking them if they want to switch jobs. And you are dealing uh, mostly with industry clients and also, de so not Egon Zehner, but you in your role and in, also with, yeah. the, uh, with the automotive aftermarket. Yeah. So in my role, it is indeed a focus on automotive. And within automotive, there's a certain focus on technology related topics. Yeah. On top of that, there's uh, quite a bit of family business or family company business that goes beyond different areas. Yeah? And here often it's the perf personal reference where somebody doing one business refers you to someone doing something entirely different. So there the spread is quite high. But the majority of my work is indeed automotive. And within automotive, I'd say there's a certain share of aftermarket simply given my own past yes. and the network and and a certain know-how of a to be honest quite fragmented and complex and, and special market right so that is a certain pillar of the work that i do indeed that's true and how does it help you coming from the aftermarket oh it's a mix so i mean if i think about it and or is it more like a hurdle <laughs> I, I, it could be both, right? Okay. I mean, there are people who've been around for decades and I have a great respect for that. There's sometimes the risk that you are in a certain limited perspective, right? Of what yeah. the, how the market could change, what might be important tomorrow, etc. So I'm, I feel quite glad having spent a few years in this market myself in a responsible position um, to to be able to judge, right? So how is it? How does it feel? What's important, yeah. etc. And in the end, also to know quite a few people. And before entering the aftermarket, you were doing something completely different. So you came into this market, and how did that happen? Because we, of course, had a had a prep talk before, and we we kind of found out that we both ended uh, in in the automotive aftermarket from different areas. And what what made you join the aftermarket in the in the first place? So if if I may, let me tell you a bit of a story because it also maybe shows how how careers have or, or the origins of careers have changed even uh, in areas like the aftermarket yeah. right so if i think back at my youth i never was the one to tinker with cars or so if at yeah. best then maybe with the lego model of a car yeah, and, and to totally the same yeah, and then at some point for me it switched over to digital topics right the c64 back then programming assembler with the 386 yeah. and and that yes. kind of stuff so we were never the guys tuning their uh, Volkswagen GTIs. And no, I never no. can tell that story with no, a I straight face. No, I have to face. admit me neither. <laughs> yeah. 
So, but then, while studying, and I studied something in the direction of computer science, yeah. I worked as a software programmer in the mobility space. Okay. And that kind of was the beginning of kind of coming into that mobility area. Um, I joined a consultancy firm. I, I worked with McKinsey for almost eight years. And that's where I actually entered the automotive world. And I have to admit, in the first few months or weeks, you know, at an OEM or at a supplier, when people were exchanging stories about engines, Yeah. And I couldn't follow, right? But I mean, you quickly learn the trade, you learn the language, you, yeah. you, and, and you still keep a certain outsider perspective. And that combination was good back then. And then over the years, I did quite a bit in automotive strategy, in R&D, in purchasing, uh, on OEM level, at suppliers, in China for a few years. So automotive became natural. And then now... It's a bit of a circle. Egon Zender actually approached me back then. And uh, they brought me to Hella. They brought you in the market. They brought me into the market, in indeed. Oh, that's, that, that, that's a full circle moment then for you. But um, talking about the aftermarket and your experience, do you think that there are any, any areas or particularities which are special about the market so that it differs from, from other industry-heavy markets? I'm, I wouldn't say it's kind of unique in a yeah. sense there's nothing like it, right? But I think it has certain elements that you could see in other markets, but maybe not in that combination, right? I mean, all the, the technical basis, the, the technical understanding that comes from automotive, Uh, I think the complexity, right? I mean, you, we are here at Auto Mechanica. How many people from all places in the world yeah. come here with different backgrounds uh, it's a global community in the end and maybe that community word that i already used i think that is really something special right i mean i remember how when i decided to leave hella back then how some people from hella but also from competitors or other suppliers distributors told me you know you'll never be fully gone from this yeah, market you yeah, will it's, stay it, part it's, of it it's a trap Yeah. <laughs> and I love it, I have to say, right? It's great coming here. It's almost mm. like meeting family. So, um, yeah, it is, it, it is kind of special. Is it unique? No, I think you can actually learn quite a bit from other industries as well. Yeah. I mean, there are other B2B distribution industries. There are other uh, industrial service industries, etc. But, but there's something special to it indeed, at yeah, least for me. Totally. And do you think like bringing people in, external people, people in like us, so somehow we ended up here. But do you think it's difficult because the aftermarket itself is, I would say, underrepresented so pe it's not it's not in the people's mind or they're all driving their car they are going to the workshop but they're not think about it as like this this huge industry it actually is i mean people are always surprised when i tell them what share not just the aftermarket in the overall automotive business but then again the independent aftermarket within that has yeah. what share not just in terms of people and and business but in particular in terms of profitability for the if you look at the whole industry yes. so it's a super relevant part and still as you say people are not really aware of it to be honest myself not having grown up in the market and being able to tell stories helps but then as you say people drive cars they they see the benefits but sometimes also the issues that they encounter so c combining that and then telling stories about why i mean there's also a certain purpose you can transport right and say keeping mobility floating do that in a sustainable way etc right it's you can i, I drive an electric vehicle yeah. right but still taking a car and making it drive longer yeah. is a cause itself right in terms of sustainability yeah, it is. It is like so i mean these different elements i wouldn't say it's easy but if i look now at my track record in the last four years or so since i've been with egon zinder And if I see, we, we did manage to bring in people from outside the aftermarket into aftermarket positions. And um, so I'm proud of that. Oh, that's good. And would you say like the, the ongoing process, the market is in change, like for the, 
for the last, I would say even for the last 10 years, it's the ongoing uh, digitalization is happening and, and, this, and th this raises the need for, for new people, for, for different people with different backgrounds. And do you think that the aftermarket is uh, prepared to compete for those people? Because we need to bring outside knowledge in now for, for what's to come. I think absolutely. You know, if I'm again, uh, if I think about automotive in general, and that's what you read a lot in the newspapers, like, I mean, these days, Volkswagen, for yes. instance, yeah, how they, can they manage this turnaround as an industry icon and at the same time with all the issues we have? Yeah, when we see new cars from other markets floating in with great software, etc., people often ask us yeah, as a firm, is there actually a chance that we can attract the right talent? You know, the thing is, when I talk to people from the software industry and I tell them, hey, there's an opportunity, you could join and now take whatever iconic brand. Yeah. You know, people love to work for things or for companies that make things they love. Yeah. And many of the software people happen to like cars. So offering them a chance to say, hey, well, do you want to continue working on whatever, social networks, mobile handsets, or whatever it is, and tell them, hey, you also have the chance to you know, live your passion and bring in your knowledge into that market, people at least listen, right? And if you look, if I stay with that example, you know, if we're talking about high-tech, autonomous driving, technology, etc., even here, yeah, you, companies struggle to find the right talent. But if you manage to find the right people, yeah, and often it's not just software developers, it's about people who understand complex systems, how do you change culture in organizations you know who have who have developed hardware for decades who have certain sa safety and security standards who have a certain way of working that has its own right yeah. and now you have software people who think entirely different i think the clue is how do you build a culture that that doesn't say how do we absorb them or how do we become like software people but how do we find a mixture that the nice combination of both and now if I come back to the aftermarket, there's a lot here, right? I mean, if you take logistics people who have managed complex supply chains and other yeah. industries, and now you bring them closer to where their passion is on the weekend, right? If I think about software again here, there's so many process steps, so many players involved. There's so much potential to improve, you know, the... the experience for drivers, for car owners, etc. Yeah. And if you can tell those stories, I do believe there's, first of all, indeed, we need yeah. many, many people with different backgrounds, but it's not like this is an unsolvable challenge, right? I think it is possible to and look at yourself. Yes. Right? No, I know. I totally agree. But I also think that one, one key factor in this is having or the possibility of having a real impact. Because when we're talking about people with a computer science background, and you said it before, I, I, do, we, do they want to work at a social network, one of the big players? And I guess the impact they can have there of course, depending on their role, but most likely their impact will be very little. Whereas when you're going into, into an industry like the automotive aftermarket, you can, really, you can really create some value there. Absolutely. And I'm not saying you can't create value there, right? It, no. But sometimes people also enter those companies, those well-known companies yeah. and great companies, with the expectation that it will be a certain startup spirit, you know, yeah. and playing foosball, table yes. soccer and things like that. And yes, a lot of that is still there. But many people in those companies come to the realization that their job is also in a big corporate and it's to some extent, you know, normal. Yeah? It's, it's a different product. It's <laughs> and I think here the aftermarket has a big strength. Yeah? There are Within the big corporates, uh, the organizations are often a bit separate with a separate culture. There are many, many small companies, there are attractive companies, there are companies where the owner can make quick decisions. Um, so I think there are many benefits that you can actually sell if you want to attract someone. The question is, how do you then make sure that someone coming in actually finds an environment that is willing to change and to adapt so that you jointly build something great and i think that's actually the bigger challenge than yeah. it's not about finding, bringing yeah. the person in it's also about listening to what he has to say 
and and vice versa right yeah totally so for them to understand so what are the critical topics here right yeah but then again that's i mean the industry is super complex sometimes uh, when i was still at hella customers told me you know in the end we i mean we buy stuff and then we sell stuff and yes we need to make that in a good way and yeah. there's lots of small issues we need to solve but essentially we have a super simple business model right and so you can grasp it coming yeah. from the outside fairly quickly i think yeah another topic is uh, the shortage of skilled labor so and many people are complaining about it especially in more technical engineering roles but would you agree that because in my opinion we have like an even maybe an artificial shortage of of skilled labor because like especially industries like ours are not addressing 50 percent of the of the people out there which is women so we str and just look around and and we, and we see the issue and we are we are really struggling at, at addressing women and bringing them into le especially also leading positions in our industry yeah absolutely and i think if you have an industry like ours where where some, maybe some of the ideals or the picture on the outside is you know mechanics tinkering with cars yeah uh, but even there, um, we tried back then to, to shift our marketing efforts to a much more emotional way. Yeah, and yes, we were still catering for people who have grown up in this industry. But even there, show, how can we use more emotion instead of technical stuff, right? How can we transport the aesthetic? You know, I mean, we, we send a photographer around the world yeah. photographing iconic workshops and and then made calendars etc out yeah. of it and if i look around now many companies go this way to go how can we go away from displaying just some components to what does it mean working here right yeah. how do we is how do we experience relationships etc right and how can we make business yeah. in a different way than maybe in other rather transactional and harsh environments so i think there are elements that you could use to attract as you say 50% yeah. of the population as well and that's maybe just a start and do you think being predominantly German market adds to this problem? Like thinking like very technical and, and efficient? Maybe, but then, but then again, it's a global market, yeah. right? And I experience more and more an international perspective, even in the more traditional German companies uh, and the other way around, right? If you look at some, and, and I mean here, consolidation comes into play as yeah. well, right? On a, on a distributor level, but also on an industry level. There's one other point I wanted to make, maybe. You can always look at shortage, but, but what is not in shortage in business, right? Yes, there's a shortage, but none of the players has a dominant position if you look at the employee market. Yeah. All of us play a super small role. Yes. So, to what extent do you care about this big shortage? or the shortage in the big picture if you are able to attract the right people yeah. by providing them with the right environment and i think i would rather say let's be bold and say we only need you know any company only needs to attract a few out of the many millions out there so let's try to offer them something that others can't and i think the aftermarket does have quite a bit to offer here so i almost flip it around and say hey if there's a shortage what's the price that you need to pay yeah. and that price doesn't need to be money only right so no as i said can be something like having a, having i being able to have a real impact in your company and it's not that we are not attracting enough people i guess we had we attracted many people new people in the last years and i want to talk about bit about leadership because we've seen a change in leadership in the within the last year so a change of personnel in leadership like in many of the of the bigger suppliers there's kind of a generational change uh, we are having so what's your take on leadership in the aftermarket in general is it also changing is the style of leadership changing as well with this new generation of leaders coming in so i mean the time frame that i can look at is roughly 10 years and if I look 
oh, and now I'm really focusing first on the top leadership level. Yeah. And if I take the usual players and the and the aftermarket leaders, uh, as well on distributor level, the 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 top heads, and then in all the companies around it, there's been quite a bit of change, right? If you see who's been there ten years ago. Who's still around in one or the other way? Yeah. Because it is a community to some is, extent, yeah. but maybe in different roles. And who has come into um, uh, large-scale leadership uh, positions? You've seen a lot of change, first of all, in terms of people. And of course, they brought in a different style. So I, I do believe you see a lot. And in the end, it's always a mix, right? The environment is different. The yeah. The, the 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 crisis but also the chances that came out of crisis right i mean if you're a good dealer then inflation is actually a very good environment yeah. to prosper in right so but how do you take uncertainty how do you deal with it um alone already had to shape the leadership style then attracting people making them successful i think the way of influencing but also developing teams and and then providing maybe more decision power to individual teams are maybe some of the elements that I've seen. And I mean, things are never black and white, but I, I do see uh, a change. Do you, do you also see a, a need in, in change? Like uh, we need a new breed of leaders for this, for this new generation of employees, which are now flocking into the market? So that's Because always the like question, the, the yeah, do the, you need it? Baby boomers, right? I mean, there are hugely successful companies who've had a, a, the same CEO for maybe 30 years yeah. and who prosper, right? So who tells them it needs to be different? But then again, if you look, we, we made a, and this is now across industries, yeah. we made a, a questionnaire and we got responses from round about a thousand CEOs from different uh, industries, mm. from different company sizes, up to the real, real big fish out there, right? Yeah. And many things are seen differently in different regions, different industries, etc. There's one topic that came across, the majority of the farmer, majority of CEOs say, if I want to transform my company to be able to address all these different changes in the environment, yeah, be it competition, be it technology, yeah. be it whatever it might be, then I need to transform myself first. And if I transform myself, then the leadership I live changes. And if I do that, then that tickles down through organizations. So, and if you now take that logic backward, right, then there is indeed a need for change in leadership yeah. absolutely and we have, we had, we talked about like uh, searching for leadership executive search but i always have uh, the the impression that like the development of leadership internal development of leaders is often overlooked at and there are maybe you have like a lot of potential leader, leaders in your organization which are which which are not seen or are not heard Yeah, and I hear the gap that I see is not necessarily a perception of we don't need to develop our leaders. Mm -hmm. I think if I asked my clients, many candidates, I think many of them would say, of course I want to de develop yes. my leaders. But first of all, how do you do it, right? Is that a yearly process that you do like, I don't know, fire protection in the hallways yeah, as a must have and then you tick it off the box? Or is that something that you live day by day yeah so in what way do you provide feedback in what way do you actually offer a stage for someone who's maybe not there yet but you give still give him or her the chance yeah how do you coach people how do you actually empower them to make decisions and yet allow for mistakes and are there to help if something goes wrong etc right i mean all these smaller elements that's a very very large part And then the more institutional part, so how do you manage that in a large-scale organization? Yeah. I think it's often that you have bits and pieces around, but how do you combine that for someone to 
to then make it a coherent development plan, right? So how do you make sure that someone gets the right feedback? And then if there's a feedback, do you actually provide the, the right opportunities for that person to grow along that feedback that you gave the person? And how do you do that on a, on a large scale, right? With dozens or even hundreds of leaders. I think that's something where, where companies can improve next to and that's the simple thing if you change your behavior your team will change the behavior right and if you as a top leader do that giving feedback providing opportunities empowering people uh, uh, failure culture etc so these things they tick they tend to tickle down right and and that's something i do see and perceive at many companies happening and if you then combine it with that more systematic approach i think that's maybe the next step And in a, in a current, like more employee driven market, what role does a company culture play into this? Because we talked about change of leaders and they lead, uh, they, they basically lead by design and what they are doing is tickling down to, to the different departments. So what role does culture play? Also in, in maybe in executive research, when you talk to potential candidates and they want to know what, what's the, what's the company culture like? So the question is, what is culture, right? And, and many people struggle with to define not just what is culture, but what is our culture in our company? What do we do, do differently? And I mean, in the end, we uh, at Egon Zindr, we use a model that breaks it down into a fairly simple framework where we say, well, what is culture? Culture is the way things are done around here. So basically, it's a, you can measure How do people behave? Yeah, do they, for instance, are they more careful and, and maybe diligent? Yeah. Or are they rather quick and, and test things with customers? As one dimension, for instance. Fail fast and But break things. Yeah. That defines culture, right? And you can measure that. And you can actually also say, we are here, but we want to be there. And then you can define how does, for instance, leadership, but how do maybe incentives, performance management programs, etc. right? How does the business logic actually drive culture? And then culture becomes a real thing you can touch and influence and not yeah. just some fluffy values written on a wall or so. Yeah, right? like and and word, in that word sense... Word in the office. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? And in that sense, I think culture is essential. And you mentioned uh, family-run businesses a couple of times. Is it or can it be in a particularly difficult, like finding a right successor for family-run business? If it was in the, within the family, I don't know, for the last 50, 100 or even 150 years, and then the, like it would be the first one from the outside coming in. I mean, first one from the outside, but also only handing over to the next generation, right? So what are expectations? Do, feel, do people feel, so does the next gen feel comfortable? Is it do a they choice? Want to do, do they it? want to do it, right? And how do you, I mean, you know, the, the burden on your shoulders, if you are in a second generation, third generation, fourth generation, it only increases yeah, it if the company bigger. is successful, yeah. right? So um, th 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 we could fill an hour with, with family businesses. And that's something th th that for me personally is really highly rewarding, being able to help families and their businesses and, and in, in often this complex situation as well, right? Um, that, that, that is a, a, good, a good and important part and a very rewarding part of the work I do as well. Oh, totally. And uh, looking a bit into the future, what do you think will be the, the, the next big topics in terms of in terms of leadership, leadership development, what, wh where, where, where are the developments, developments heading to within the next five to ten years? So, I mean, there's no simple answer to that, right? And I think many of the topics we touched will remain important to further develop them, etc. And then I think there are some topics that come into play as well, right? I mean, in, in some way, technology is, is influencing us increasingly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we heard it in our breakfast this morning. In sports, you have technology influencing it. In our businesses, we have that. And in leadership itself, technology can help. 
Will I be able to create an AI lead for one of my teams? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you believe that? Leading by, leading by chatbot. So, I mean, that this, that, that I'm pretty certain that there will be a certain essence, I hope also, there's a certain essence that you cannot automize. No, I agree. Right? I mean, otherwise, it's some bots uh, communicating via whatever protocols or so. Yeah. I mean, there's a human... There element, will be a human element. Uh, that, that I believe is super important Why in, in leadership. And as long as there's people to lead, yeah. there's also a leader that can help develop those people, right? And in that sense, I believe yeah. uh, technology can always help, but it cannot replace. But it's neither one nor zero. You need to read between the, the lines. I mean, it was an example just before the recording when we spoke to, to, to our team. There, there are like some small nuances maybe and AI couldn't even, couldn't even comprehend what it is about. Absolutely. I recently read an article, can AI actually create art? And by definition, right, it tries to find the most likely next word. And, and if you talk about Gen yes. AI model. Yeah. So does a leader... Sh should a leader find the most likely next word? Ideally not. No, I agree. Thank you very much for your time being my guest here. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for the opportunity and for b being able to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.